Good evening, everyone. This is Tim Ash, president of the Vermont State Senate, here with uh, my Thursday Ask Me Anything session. Uh, this week, I had encouraged people to submit questions to me uh, in advance, and you're welcome to do it uh, in the middle of uh, the next 30 minutes, uh, with a focus on gun safety legislation. As I've mentioned previously, while we're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the economic and public health uh, damage that it's inflicted, that doesn't mean that other challenges that face our state, our nation, our region, just go away. And there will be uh, a moment where it's time to start revisiting a number of these other uh, important policy and public health measures uh, and debate them fair, fairly and openly uh, and make decisions as a state. Uh, over the last few years, before I turn to some of the questions, um, we've had uh, two sort of a mixed experience. Two years ago, uh, we passed the first significant gun safety legislation in Vermont's history uh, while respecting people's Second Amendment rights. Uh, that created universal background checks, which basically meant that no matter where you purchased a firearm, if it wasn't from a family member, you would have to do the same background check that you would do if you went to a licensed firearm dealer. So uh, no imposition that's greater than going to a firearm dealer, um, except that you had to um, now kind of fall under the same general uh, background check rule that most gun purchases were going through. Uh, we also uh, increased the purchase age of uh, longer guns to the age of 21, uh, unless you've taken an approved uh, hunter safety uh, or firearm safety course. Um, handguns already was 21 as part of a national law. Uh, we passed extreme risk protection orders. This is something that um, ironically originated uh, as an NRA-backed uh, measure, which focused on a constitutional process that would allow uh, law enforcement to intervene in certain instances when there was good reason to believe someone posed a harm uh, to him or herself or to others. That has now been used in almost every county in the state. Uh, and at least in one instance um, was done to uh, guard against a potential shooting at a school uh, subsequent to the Fairhaven incident, which in some ways reignited the discussion and helped change Governor Scott's overall views about whether we needed any gun, uh, gun legislation. Uh, it also banned bump stocks, which are the, um, the modification device that allows particular, particularly high volume of uh, ammunition to be fired off in a very short period of time. Uh, that was the one thing that President Trump said he was ready to do right after, I believe, the Las Vegas shooting at the concert there. So last year, we uh, tried to pass some additional measures that were vetoed by Governor Scott. I would say that the uh, hallmark of, of that legislation were a 24-hour waiting period for uh, handgun purchases uh, and a uh, closing of the so-called Charleston loophole, which the Charleston loophole, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is so-called because um, if the normal background check system doesn't work, uh, it doesn't produce an answer one way or the other after three days, it is up to the seller of the firearm to decide or at their, his or her discretion whether to sell the firearm to the individual anyways. This was a, originally an attempt to make sure we had a very good background check system nationally uh, and to put pressure on the federal government to get it right so that people wouldn't uh, have their Second Amendment rights restricted in that way. Um, the individual who shot up the church in Charleston uh, had not uh, had the background check come up with a resolution to whether he could be purchasing, uh, went ahead and received the firearm and then shot up um, the church and killed so many people with that. So um, that bill was vetoed. Um, and the Senate uh, has the votes to override it. The House was short of that. And so uh, at this point, it's uh, probably a discussion that the next legislature will have to have. Um, so now I'm going to turn to some questions that have come in. And I'm uh, somewhat unsurprised that many of the questions are from people uh, who uh, are quite adversarial to any new gun safety legislation. Um, but I believe that it's important to confront these discussions head on. I 
I'm going to respond to these questions without judgment about the people who wrote them in. Um, but while some of them are rather blunt uh, in the way they've been expressed, uh, they are fair points that someone who views the world differently than me can do. And I'm going to give my honest answer and uh, we'll have to, in probably some cases, agree to disagree. And that's the democratic process, which I believe in so strongly. So first question that came in that says, do you know criminals don't care about gun laws and will get them either way? So what does constricting the law abiding citizen that wants to protect themselves do? Um, and then uh, proceeds to say, you think they can't get an AR-15 with a 30 round magazine or that they can't get a fully automatic, uh, by which I believe they mean criminals, people who don't care what the law says. Uh, and the short story is, yeah, I believe that many people who intend to commit crimes are by nature not inclined to worry about uh, the legality of the purchase they're making if they're determined to get their hands on firearms. Um, however, that doesn't mean that we should not uh, place some safeguards where possible to prevent them from getting certain firearms. For instance, um, closing the Charleston loophole uh, would prevent people who are perhaps ineligible to purchase certain firearms because they are felons um, from getting them because the system hasn't produced a result in three days. Um, so if uh, someone who intends to commit a crime is buying it sort of illegally offline, uh, not through a licensed dealer and not obeying Vermont law uh, to have a background check regardless of where the guns purchased from, um, uh, that individual uh, will try whatever uh, he or she can do to get it. However, there will be instances, and this has happened all across the country, where people who are prohibited uh, because they are felons from purchasing it get rooted out uh, from the background checks system. So uh, closing the Charleston loophole in that sense, there's no way of predicting precisely how many people will not inappropriately or illegally uh, be able to purchase a firearm, uh, but it can happen. So um, that's my answer to that part of the question. The que the, this particular questioner uh, raised a number of them, but uh, I'll cut to the chase. How about we think about what brought the people who've committed suicide by firearm, what brought them to that? Uh, and then can, uh, the, would offer some conjecture. How about Vermont's low wages, high taxes, high rent? You think struggling to raise family could make someone depressed or how about drug abuse? In that regard, um, let me say that um, about 89% of the firearm deaths in Vermont from 2011 to 2018 were suicides. There were 568 total Vermonters who died by firearm. 89% of those were suicides. And these are each a tragedy uh, unto itself, for sure. Uh, an individual who had family, friends. Um, and so I don't want to treat them, treat anyone who's gone through this or the people who've survived them um, as numbers. What I will say is that we do know that uh, people, particularly who are experiencing acute mental health crisis, uh, often are, are more prone to make impulsive decisions um, and maybe going through volatile emotional uh, or mental episodes that um, with a little time uh, may uh, produce uh, a different way of seeing what the future can be in a more positive light. So a waiting period of 24 hours, which is what the legislature passed last year, um, is not a very long time, but 24 hours for someone going through an acute episode can be like a lifetime. And so uh, I can't uh, imagine or put myself in the uh, place of someone who has reached that point, uh, but will say that a waiting period of any duration can only increase the chance that someone uh, is able to have a conversation with someone uh, or, or get to the other side of a particularly dark moment so that they have a chance to, um, to continue to live. As far as the issue of uh, things that might be contributing to uh, the suicide in the first place, these issues of uh, Vermont's low wages, high taxes, high rent, to the extent those are stressors, I will answer your question as straightforwardly as you've asked it. Many things make people very stressed and um, can put pressure on people and possibly lead them to the most tragic of circumstances of committing suicide. Um, and to the extent that wages or high taxes or high rent are contributors, um, those are factors that we should be working on in general for many 
uh, beneficial reasons. Um, we increased the minimum wage uh, this past year, which will go into effect in this coming January and the following January. Still won't get it up as high as it should, but it will help alleviate the economic stress of many people. In terms of high rent, uh, we have supported the largest boost in housing construction in Vermont's recent history, and we have much more to do. Um, so in those regards, maybe there's some common ground uh, and we can help address uh, some of the uh, suffering people have that might lead them to make that decision. Another question that came in, uh, it says, please, how, please explain how restricting me, a five foot two female, is protecting me. Explain how does infringing upon my right to self-defend make me safer? Um, well, I guess my answer to that is that um, we have a different view about whether uh, this is infringing upon your right to self-defend to make you safer. Uh, nothing that I have advocated for uh, would uh, prohibit um, any person from purchasing a firearm as long as it's lawful for them to do so. And um, a 24-hour waiting period for a lawful uh, gun owner, someone who's lawfully able to possess a firearm, is uh, a, a, I perhaps could agree that it, there is a uh, a, a slight restriction in the sense of instead of getting it within getting it on the spot it's a 24-hour waiting period or it could be 48 whatever the number of hours is um, however there's nothing stopping the purchase of that firearm just that there's going to be that uh, slight waiting period uh, and so in that uh, regard I also don't believe that it makes any individual less safe to have to wait um, the 24 hours or 48 hours in order to uh, make the purchase so uh, I will respectfully disagree with the questioner with the premise um, that somehow a brief waiting period or closing the Charleston loophole uh, will make someone uh, less safe. Um, this one says, Tim, I'd like to ask you how in the hell you can even for a half second think more restrictions will stop criminal activity. Um, and I'll just say to that um, that many public health and public safety measures can't quantify the reduction of any particular um, you know, outcome that is gonna be reduced or increased depending on what the policy measure is. What I can say is that the background check system nationally comes up with people frequently who are ineligible to purchase because they are felons or for some other reason. So it stands to reason and one can debate or Pose hypotheticals will tell me exactly how many people in Vermont will be uh, caught under that kind of scenario. And I can't answer that one. No one can. But it stands to reason that if the three day uh, window for the background, national background check system to produce a result fails to produce a result in some percentage of the cases, some percentage of those will also be cases where the person shouldn't be buying the firearm. Now, whether they're criminals or they're people who've been deemed uh, uh, unlawful to possess a firearm based on a mental health um, status. Um, it could be it could be either, frankly. Um, but that three that Charles closing of the Charleston loophole will not make people less safe. It can only make them more safe, and can only do a better job at making sure people who are not uh, uh, legally allowed to purchase firearms and possess them um, to do so. So. You know, I, I guess I'd have to leave uh, that one uh, there. The other is that the top researchers in the country around waiting periods specifically uh, have shown that in uh, jurisdictions where there is a waiting period that um, suicide, uh, firearm deaths, and violent firearm deaths have both um, been uh, seen to be reduced. So um, I've got a question that just popped up. Suicide is indeed a tragedy, uh, but the underlying issue is availability to mental health. Uh, what are you doing towards addressing the root cause as opposed to a symptom? Um, and it's a good question, and I'm familiar with um, uh, the person who is asking the question. Uh, and he points out that uh, my, my primary advocacy was to prevent um, unnecessary suicide by firearm or hopefully avoidable suicide by firearm. And in that regard, Chris is right that my primary emphasis based on our experience here in Vermont is reducing suicide by firearm because that's 89% of our firearm deaths. Um, and I believe that a waiting period 
uh, is a very slight imposition um, to do what we've seen the research shows will do and save people's lives. Um, but in terms of uh, the root causes of mental health, I mean, this is one of those areas when the governor vetoed uh, the waiting period bill uh, that also included closing the Charleston loophole. In part, he said, we have to focus on the root cause, I'm paraphrasing, but in his veto letter, uh, we need to focus more on mental health. Well, of course, the governor's budgets have included effectively zero dollars of additional support for mental health. It has been the legislature, and I've been proud in the Senate that this is where it's, a lot of it's originated. We've stepped up with substantial increases in funding for the mental health workforce to make sure that we have um, a sustainable path and a profession for people who are trained in mental health. Um, so people have more ready access no matter where they live in Vermont. Um, I have been personally dedicated each of the last three years going into this year that we would increase our overall support for our mental health system and we have followed through each of those years. That doesn't mean we've solved the problem. I think the mental health um, yeah, the crisis might be the word, but all across um, the country, um, the volume of mental health uh, mental health being presented, uh, whether it's in schools or uh, hospitals or just in the community has been rising. And so we all have as a society much work to do. Uh, but I do believe that in addition, we should be focusing on many root causes. Um, but that doesn't mean that we uh, don't respect people's Second Amendment rights, while also making sure we help reduce unnecessary deaths in the state. But thank you, Chris, for the respectful um, question. Um, Another question, gun safety, more like disarm law-abiding citizen laws. Um, with the last few weeks, I'd say it's even more clear why we need guns, or should we just keep those in the hands of the police with no chance of fighting back? So the first part of that I'll take is um, the gun safety question mark, more like disarm law-abiding citizen laws. There's nothing um, that has been proposed which would remove firearms from a law-abiding citizen. So. Uh, in that regard, there's often a worry amongst some that there's a like a slippery slope. We'll do something that's very reasonable and completely respecting of people's Second Amendment rights, but it's not that that's the problem. It's the thing that might happen next. And um, I've always believed um, that this is uh, each issue should be judged on its own merits, and um, a waiting period does not remove the firearms from any law-abiding person. As far as the issue of uh, it's more clear why we need guns uh, or just give them to the police with no chance of fighting back. I mean, this is a fraught time uh, in terms of uh, public discussions about our relationship to law enforcement. And I think, um, first of all, because no one's proposing taking firearms from law-abiding citizens, um, I, it's not quite a, a realistic portrayal of anything that's been proposed. Um, I do hope that as we continue to discuss law enforcement policy changes and reforms, um, that the emphasis always be on peaceful resolution to every situation that they're confronted with, uh, and that uh, moving forward, um, the solution is to find a way that we can we build back up the um, relationship, which across the country has clear fr clearly frayed. Um, in many communities and amongst different populations. Um, so we have a lot of work to do there. Um, here's a question that says, um, so you'll close the Charleston loophole and get waiting periods passed in a role where you don't craft legislation after spending years as the Senate president. Well, it is true. I've been the president of the Senate for three years. Um, this is about, I'm about three and a half years in. Uh, and the second year I was there, we did pass the first significant gun safety legislation in Vermont's history. I don't run away from that. I'm proud of that. I also respect people's Second Amendment rights and the traditional hunting uh, and uh, sports traditions here in Vermont. And I believe that there's nothing incompatible about those two things. And then last year, we did pass uh, a waiting period of 24 hours for handgun purchases and closing the Charleston loophole. Uh, the governor vetoed it, and frankly, um, we have the support in the Senate, which is where uh, I serve, to override the governor's veto, but the votes aren't there in the House of Representatives right now. I wish that was not the case. Uh, however, that is um, the case, uh, and I can't wish that away. So, as a lieutenant governor, what would change about that? Well, 
largely, uh, not only would I continue to engage directly with people uh, with all perspectives um, on gun legislation, uh, but I believe that as Lieutenant Governor could go out and make an articulate case uh, for why we do need waiting periods uh, and why closing the Charleston loophole is the right thing to do. And an example of that, I'll just be really clear, um, you know, as the Lieutenant Governor liberated from the day-to-day -day, uh, management of the Vermont Senate and having to uh, handle every bit of um, negotiation on issues large and small and in between with both the, within the Senate, with the House, and with the administration, um, the Lieutenant Governor can actually go out and marshal larger enthusiasm and support for various policies. Um, obviously, rebuilding the state from the economic damage from COVID-19 is my primary focus uh, as I run for Lieutenant Governor and will be as Lieutenant Governor. Uh, and I have a number of other visions about how we close the gap between what I call the two Vermonts to make sure we revitalize our struggling rural communities uh, and help get people out of poverty uh, and really reinvigorate the fight against poverty rather than just try to manage people's prop, uh, poverty. But as a small example of the kind of thing that I would do, I brought uh, two of the leading researchers in the nation about the efficacy of waiting periods uh, to Vermont this past February, this February. Um, they spoke to several legislative committees. Their research um, found that waiting periods reduce firearm suicide rate by 7 to 11%. So that's real lives saved right here in Vermont. Um, and as a Lieutenant Governor, you have the opportunity to get away from the lobbyists in the state house and go talk about these issues directly in the communities. So that, you know, when we have a veto, if we have a veto, um, there's an opportunity for community members to call their senator, or in this case, house member, and say, hey, you know, I'd rather save lives than um, you know, be unwilling to confront some of these discussions uh, that need to happen. So that's how I see the difference in my role as lieutenant governor. I've marshaled the support in the Senate. I believe the public is very, very, very strongly in favor of these things, um, but I, I can't uh, produce votes in the House, which I don't lead. And so, uh, but as Lieutenant Governor, I can help uh, work with people in both the Senate and the House and in the public uh, to get it done. Um, and the last question I've got here for the moment says, tell me, sir, how many suicides have occurred in Vermont within 24 hours of a firearm purchase? How many firearms suicides occur in Vermont annually? Uh, do you think someone hell-bent on taking their life won't find another method if, if a gun isn't available uh, and then it proceeds to make a case for uh, throwing in cars and bridges and other drugs and things and ropes into the discussion about guns. So let me um, start with the question of how many suicides have occurred in Vermont within 24 hours of a firearm purchase. Uh, truthfully, the data hasn't been collected to answer that question. And so if that was the only basis for someone making a decision, um, regardless of which side you're on um, this particular issue, um, you'd be left wanting. That data doesn't exist. Uh, how many firearms occur, uh, how many firearm suicides occur in Vermont annually? I mentioned that there were, uh, that uh, 568 people died by firearm over a seven year period and that 90% of those were by suicide. I'm not going to uh, embarrass myself by trying to do the math uh, very quickly on that one, um, but the number is uh, probably in the uh, 50 and uh, I'm wanting to say in the 50 individual range, um, whatever it is, it's a number that I think is too high. And to the extent that we can do something about it, that's what motivates me. Um, then the question uh, of, do you think someone hell bent on taking their life won't find another method if a gun isn't available? On this one, um, I really um, took away uh, the very powerful testimony of a pediatric um, uh, MD at the University of Vermont Medical Center um, who, who was really talking about uh, the impulsivity of someone, uh, especially younger people. Um, but as we know, even uh, young males in particular, their brains are still developing to the age of 26. Uh, women develop, uh, their brains develop a little faster probably unsurprising to, fem to women who are watching this. Um, but the 
takeaway from that presentation from that medical doctor was that many of the individuals who had attempted uh, to take their life with a firearm but failed when recovered expressed regret at having attempted and didn't try it again and that really speaks to this issue of someone who is quote unquote as the question said hell-bent uh, on committing suicide and it turns out that some people especially on the younger end of the age spectrum make decisions that are more impulsive uh, when they feel that things will never get better they've gone through a particular heartbreak or lost someone in their family something uh, traumatic has happened uh, but with some time with the with you know some treatment with contact and communication with trusted friends or family, people uh, can get through a dark moment. Will this solve every instance with a waiting period? The short answer is no. But we have heard from families uh, who have said they believe that even that brief imposition of a waiting period of 24 hours, which we were being told was too few by some advocates of waiting periods, that, that even that 24 hours could have made all the difference. Can we ever prove it? The answer is no. Uh, but we know that it does give someone that chance to get to the other side of a very dark moment. And so uh, for all of those reasons, I continue to stand behind that legislation. And um, while I know that there are people who feel very strongly that there should be absolutely no gun laws, and I can respect that they are entitled to that position, I don't judge them for that position, but I also ask that they respect that I see things differently and many other people do. And so we go through the democratic process and um, we respect the Constitution and we pass laws that we think are in the public interest. And uh, I'd rather be upfront and direct about it than uh, we've seen sometimes in the past. So um, with that, that wraps up the questions that I had received uh, in advance. Um, let me see if another one has come in. Uh, and um, some data that's come in. Um, so. With that, I'm going to sign off. Uh, I hope if you haven't already checked out some of the other updates I've provided in recent uh, days. Uh, last Wednesday, I had a nice, well, I shouldn't say nice, but a very interesting conversation with Bill McKibben about lessons we can take from COVID-19 that could apply to our uh, addressing the other existential crisis, which is climate change. Um, had a very uh, informative discussion on Monday with three uh, professionals at Washington County Mental Health Services talking about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the work that they do, both from the, the mental health professionals point of view and also the clients that they serve and how this might impact both the profession and the clients moving forward in complex ways. Things that we're going to really have to think about, uh, you know, as we start to uh, try to return to some new semblance of normal, some new equilibrium. Um, so I'll be back uh, tomorrow with a new update, and I hope you continue to stay safe. Um, in recent days, as you know, there have been a couple um, communities uh, close to where I live, which have had um, out outbreak, as I don't know if that's the right terminology to use, but um, significant uh, number of positive tests in a fairly short period of time, more than I think 60 at this point, another uh, 16 today. So the, the risks associated with COVID-19 still remain. Um, people were, I think, rightly celebrating when there were zero people with a positive test for COVID-19 in a Vermont hospital. Um, but then, of course, with the new infections that started to pop up, we were at four. I think today we're at three. So the point being that for people who are vulnerable, either because of um, an underlying condition or age, they're as vulnerable today as they were on March 13th when the state went into state of emergency. So we have to keep taking actions as if it might benefit someone we might not ever lay our eyes on, um, even though uh, we're all tempted to uh, sort of re revisit our old lives um, as quickly as we can. So I'm going to sign off. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.